welcome back. Today we are going to be going over chapter 8 in Animal Farm. And by now you should have read chapter 8. And you also should have completed your questions in the Google Classroom for chapter 8. So today we are going to go over some literary terms. We're going to cover some of the plot events in chapter eight, and we are also going to be digging deeper into our themes and our overarching concepts. Uh, for the literary terms, we're going to focus today on epithet and theme and simile. The first one, epithet, you might recall from our unit on Greek mythology, and the Odyssey or Ulysses, for those of you who read Ulysses. And an epithet is a descriptive phrase expressing a characteristic of the person or thing that is mentioned. So back when we had our mythology unit, uh, Athena, for example, would often be introduced as gray-eyed Athena. Just a, a brief description of her. And here in chapter eight, we now have an abundance of epithets for Napoleon. He is called father of all animals, terror of mankind, protector of the sheepfold, and duckling's friend, among other things. Uh, we also are continuing our theme in chapter eight. And again, the theme is the universal message of a story. And our theme is still the importance of education and the consequences or ramifications of being uneducated. So you see here in this chapter, yet again, the, um, the consequences of the overwhelming majority of animals being illiterate. So they don't notice the changes to the commandments that are inscribed on the barn wall. They're unable to read or verify these alleged documents that exist. Um, and the animals that are educated do have more power and, and ability and safety than the other animals. And lastly, we have simile in this chapter. And you know that a simile is a comparison of two dissimilar things using the words like or as. And during the battle scene in chapter eight, uh, we have a sentence that has the cruel pellets swept over them like hail, comparing the bullets of the human's guns to hail in a hailstorm. All right, so the events in chapter eight. We start off the chapter, and this is after um, the executions in the end of chapter seven. And the animals really think they remember the commandments quite clearly, as well as old major's tenets of animalism, that no animal shall ever kill any other animal. And they go to look at the barn wall to verify this. And where the commandments are written, where they are painted on the wall, it now says that no animal shall kill any other animal without cause. So um, it has been altered and it was stated very clearly in the beginning of things that these commandments were unalterable, that they were unchangeable, that they were fixed. And yet here they are stretching and changing over the course of time to uh, make the pig's behavior acceptable, to make it permissible, I guess, to make it legal in terms of animalism. Uh, the, they mulled this over, the other animals, and they realized um, that the executions, the killing of other animals, is, in a sense, justifiable for any animal who leagued themselves with Snowball. 
And although that sounds reasonable, I think um, it is missed with these animals who lack insight and knowledge and education that if they really think deeply about it, they've all been in league with Snowball. They were all his friend. They all um, carried out his orders in battle. They respected him. They took him as their leader. So if we dig a little deeper here, none of them are safe. All right, so the animals work harder than ever. Um, the previous winter had been a tough one. It was it was difficult trying to balance the needs of the windmill with the needs of the harvest, yet they pull both off this year in record time. So the windmill is built, the harvest is done, things are looking good. Um, meanwhile, Squealer is running around citing fake statistics and percentages that there's been an increase in food from 200% to 300%. So he's resting his propaganda, his persuasive techniques on logos, which is facts and figures. And the reason this should give us pause is because these are just um, fake facts and figures. Again, there is no data or evidence. All right, so it's mentioned that things are now not any better than they were in Jones's day. The animals are hungry. They are tired. Um, it, it's really not working out for them. Napoleon now only appears every so often, and when he does appear on a special occasion, he is surrounded by dogs, and now the dogs um, have another member of the animal kingdom. There is a black rooster that parades out in front of Napoleon announcing his presence, much like you would imagine someone would do for a king or um, another member of royalty back in the day. So Napoleon is now only referred to in his formal style. Nobody is simply stating Napoleon. Instead, they have to fully introduce him as our leader, Comrade Napoleon. So yet again, an imbalance of power. He is not equal. He has these special privileges and he capitalizes on them. All credit for everything that happens that's good on the farm is given to Napoleon. Uh, so if a chicken lays five eggs, the quantity of eggs is attributed to Napoleon. Or if there's animals enjoying a refreshing drink from the drinking pond, they attribute the quality of water to Napoleon. And this is a little outlandish, um, but it's what they're doing. There's now a poem by one of the pig poets named Minimus, and the poem is titled Comrade Napoleon, and it is just very complimentary of uh, Napoleon, as well as it's very hyperbolic, just exaggerating his benevolence and how important he is and what all he has done for the animals on the farm. But this poem is written on the opposite wall of the barn as the seven commandments and napoleon's picture is also hung next to this poem uh there's rumors of snowball still circulating on the farm it's a little more complicated now because napoleon has been in negotiations with the the neighboring farms the humans on the neighboring farms so there's frederick and there's Pilkington, and he's going back and forth, and whichever one Napoleon is not favoring at that moment, that is where Snowball is accused of residing, um, where he's accused of hiding and causing some mischief. So one day Snowball is with Pilkington, the other day Snowball is with Frederick, and I want you to know that Snowball 
is just gone, right? He He's not anywhere. These are just rumors. He is, in a sense, this malevolent phantom who, when it's convenient, arises to take the brunt of the blame for whatever is going wrong or whatever is not working out. Um, he's accused of working with Frederick and Pilkington, Napoleon, while all these negotiations are happening and these rumors are circulating, he now has 24 hour a day, seven day a week protection. There is a dog stationed at all four posts of his bed watching over him. He has a food taster to make sure that his food is not poisoned. Um, it, it's wild. There are reports uh, being shared that horrible things are happening on Frederick's farm, that he has flogged a horse to death, that he's starving his cows, that for fun he threw a dog into a furnace, and that he has been tying razor blades onto the heels of chickens and well, not chickens, roosters, and making them fight aggressively and, and bloodily to the death. And this is yet another component of our allegory, because Frederick is an allegorical representation of Hitler in Germany. And Pilkington would be an allegorical representation of Great Britain and America. Snowball is... Meanwhile, while, you know, news is leaking out about what's happening on Frederick's farm, Snowball has been accused of tampering with the seed corn that would grow corn in a field. And he's accused of swapping it with seeds for weeds. So the result in reality is that there's a field of weeds where there should be corn, which again is a reduction in food. And again, it's not Snowball's doing, it's just an oversight on the part of the pigs. Um, now it is stated that Snowball never, at any point in time, ever received the award Animal Hero First Class. In fact, he was censured for his um, cowardice and his betrayal in the Battle of the Cowshed. And again, this is all untrue. The mill is finally completed, the windmill, and um, Napoleon goes to check it out, and he decides to name it Napoleon Mill. And remember, the windmill is a symbol of power in this story, so right now Napoleon has all the power, and the animals have given it to him, and the humans are, um, the neighboring farm humans, they're very taken with this windmill, the symbol of power, and they want that power too, which will come up in just a minute. Napoleon agrees to engage in trade. He's been sitting on some seasoned wood, some seasoned timber, um, which when you're cutting down trees to make wood, you need to let those trees sit for at least a year so they are usable so you could build with them because fresh wood is is no good you need to let it season and age so he has this very valuable wood he agrees to sell it to frederick and he thinks that he outsmarted the system napoleon thinks that he's getting an increased value for this wood however whimper shows up in a panic one day and informs napoleon that the money that Frederick gave him for the wood was fake, that he got nothing for it. And so begins the battle of the windmill. So Frederick and the humans on Frederick's farm, they come to attack. They come with their guns. They are heavily weaponed. And it is an aggressive, violent, brutal battle. Many animals are killed or injured. Um, at first, the animals have a very tough time defending the farm, and they see 
that the humans go to the windmill and they um, dig out a hole and they put dynamite in the windmill and they blow it up. So all that progress is lost. The power has been seized by the humans. However, the animals rally. They are very upset at what happens to their windmill and they fight relentlessly and they win the battle. There's a moment that you could easily gloss over that I want to point out to you. And it's stated that Boxer broke the heads of three humans. So from a previous chapter, Boxer had not lost his humanity. He still had empathy and compassion. He said that he never wants to kill another living creature, even if it's a human. And here he has killed three. And this is significant because all people have this moment um, that will change them when their backs are against the wall and they have to fight for their survival. Boxer is fighting for his survival, for his life, for his food, for his shelter. He has nothing and he can't lose anymore. So he's in a position where he has to compromise his values in order to survive. So I think we could fairly say that in this moment, forced to make a choice between surviving and doing the moral thing, Boxer chose survival over morals and values. And uh, you could justify that, I suppose. It's agreed that the battle will be called the Battle of the Windmill. After they bury the animal casualties, there's a, a big two-day celebration where all the animals get an apple and the chickens get some extra corn and the dogs each get three dog biscuits. And Napoleon gives himself an award. He gives himself an award called the Order of the Green Banner. And it's not worth knowing what he did or what it represents because it doesn't matter. Because at this point, Napoleon is all about himself and whatever makes him feel good or looks look good, he's going to do. So it's an irrelevant award and it's not deserved at all whatsoever. He's just um, narcissistic. Weird things start happening at the farmhouse. The animals think one night they overhear a botched version of Beasts of England. There's a lot of activity and a lot of noise and it turns out that the pigs living in the farmhouse found some whiskey in the basement and um, it's not stated but it's implied that they have been consuming the whiskey and the next morning there's um, there's a panic on the farm that there's something wrong with Napoleon. He's not feeling well. He thinks he's dying. And what we could safely infer from this is that Napoleon has a very bad hangover from his night of drinking whiskey. He says, you know, while he's feeling ill from being hungover, that he decrees that alcohol is prohibited, that no animal shall consume it. Um, he recovers because he's fine, just a little hungover. He makes a decision once he's fully recovered that the pasture, the paddock that was always intended to be a retirement spot for the senior animals will be tilled up and they will plant barley, which they will make alcohol with. So, so much for the commandment that no, alco no animal shall drink alcohol. Another night, they hear a very loud noise, and they run out to the barn to see what happened, and they find Squealer, who has fallen off of a ladder, and there's paint everywhere, and a paintbrush, and now the commandment that was unalterable, that was written on the wall, it now reads, no animal shall drink alcohol to excess. So there it is plain as day that these commandments have been being altered. 
there's evidence and we don't know how the animals are going to proceed forward with this evidence that the pigs have switched up and have changed these commandments and have been doing things that they were never supposed to do. Right, so taking some of your questions that you submitted for chapter eight, the first question, why did the pigs break the code and drink the whiskey? And um, I think the best way to answer this is the pigs are becoming more and more human-like every day. They're doing the things that they were told they must never do. They must never be like the humans. And yet with every passing few paragraphs, they start doing more human-like things because they want the privilege and they want the power that comes with having privilege, whether it's sleeping in a house, sleeping in a bed, drinking alcohol, killing the other animals. We're going to see if they start wearing clothing. Um, they've already engaged in trade and um, have held money. And so this is yet another thing that was written in the commandments that they are violating. And they're going to manipulate that commandment to suit their desires. Why do the animals prefer Pilkington to Frederick? Um, it goes back and forth, right? So the story is an allegory and it's based on uh, the Battle of Stalingrad, this chapter, which was when Hitler and Germany invaded into part of Russia which that part of Russia was actually named after Stalin, hence why it was called Stalingrad, which it no longer is. Um, but Russia and Stalin, they were trying to figure out which countries during this time period they would align themselves with, that they would make an alliance with. And on one hand, you had Hitler and all that he was doing in Germany. And on the other hand, you had America and Great Britain, and they had to make a choice. And oftentimes, um, people, like, people who think similarly pair up. So it kind of made sense for Russia at the time to align themselves with Germany and have these two powerful dictators working together to largely at some point take over the world, which was a wrong move. It didn't work out. It didn't work out here in the book. It didn't work out historically. Um, and, you know, dictators don't share nicely. So Germans finally stop believing what they're told by the pigs. And this one's a little deep too. So they are controlled mentally and physically by the pigs and they are manipulated mentally and physically by the pigs. And they have, in a sense, bonded with their captors. They see, they have seen, what happens and how dangerous it is to disagree or to break out of that herd mentality to go against what they're being told and the risk for doing the right thing which is also doing what no one else is doing is violence and death so they're probably not going to stop doing what the pigs tell them to do or believing what the pigs tell them to believe because right now they're in survival mode. They're just trying to survive, which um, is one of the most primitive responses, right? So surviving comes before uh, prosperity here and they're just trying to hang in. All right, so those are good questions. Keep up the good work. Keep the questions coming. 
we're going to dig just a little deeper into chapter eight, touching on these same concepts we've been touching on. So our revisionist history, our gaslighting, the importance of education. Let's start with revisionist history. So it is stated that Snowball had never received Animal Hero First Class. It's stated by Scooter that this was merely a legend. We know that he did. Um, you know, Napoleon has taken over. He has won. He's the victor here. And it was stated in the earlier lesson that history is told through the eyes of the winners, of the victors. And here we have Napoleon through the channel of Squealer revising the course of history, revising what happened. So it's going to continue happening. It has happened. Uh, Napoleon and the pigs alter the true events of history to make themselves appear more benevolent, more favorable. And so we also have gaslighting. It's stated in the chapter right after this. Squealer says, once again, some of the animals heard this with a certain bewilderment, but Squealer was soon able to convince them that their memories had been at fault. And gaslighting is that mental manipulation of another person that over time causes them to doubt what they know. It makes them feel a little crazy. So Squealer has successfully caused them to question, to rethink what they knew to be true. He has manipulated them into accepting his truth instead of their truth. And their truth was the actual truth. And lastly, the importance of education. Because had the other animals invested into learning, into growing, into acquiring knowledge, they would have been better able to combat this control, this takeover, this oppression. They are being oppressed now by the pigs. So in order to really be free, one must also be educated. All right, let's go over some of our questions for chapter eight. We have here a three level study guide again. And like past times, the green section should be the easiest. You have three statements in the green section and you are going to tell me whether those statements are true or false. So your first statement is Napoleon does not receive any special treatment. Is that true or is that false? The second statement, the pigs drink alcohol. Is that true or is that false? And the third statement, Napoleon is changing the commandments. Is that true or is that false? And then for each statement, I also need you go to, to go back into chapter eight in the online book and give me the page number where this information can be proven true or false. The yellow section is a little more difficult. You have six statements, same thing on the left, true or false, but now, um, in addition to a page number from where this is, can be proven to be either true or false, I need a direct quote from chapter 8 proving it to be true or false. And your statements are, the pigs are respectful of the seven commandments and follow them faithfully. Conditions on animal farm are worse than ever. All animals are equal on animal farm. The animals and the humans are getting along. Napoleon is personally responsible for many of the improvements on Animal Farm. And the animals won a great victory over the humans. So on the left, true or false. On the right, I need a direct quote from the story and a page number. 
And lastly, the bottom section. You will not find this in the book. Rather, this is your own opinion and you need to explain your opinion. So we have a statement. You're going to identify whether you think it's true or false. Our statement is propaganda works on regular people in our own society. And then to the right, an explanation on whether you believe this to be true or false. So lastly, I just want to point out for you, we still have work in the Google Classroom. Um, it's been posted here. Make sure you're completing it. Next week, all we have left is two chapters of this book and a couple assignments. And we're done with the heavy lifting for this quarter. All right, so like always, feel free to email me, um, click on the link for video chat, whatever. If you have any comments or questions or concerns, and I will see you guys next week. All right, that's it for today. Bye.